It is likely at this point the storyteller will knock back his drink and attempt to rise. You must persuade him to stay, because at this point you are in over your head. It is said to be very bad luck to leave any tale of heroes, even such questionable figures as these, unfinished. In fact, you could reason that it is even more important to finish the account of what happened in that village, for such dark occurrences bring with them their own scale of superstition and luck. You must make him finish the story, even if that means forcing him to do so. Unmasked, the man's face was blank. Not blank as in the sense that he was expressionless, but literally featureless. The skin was bleached white, stretched over the skull without breaking for a mouth or nose. The only part recognizable as human was the eyes. And even then, to compare those empty, tar-black pits from which occasional fluid trickled was a stretch indeed. The armor which had been previously concealed beneath his heavy floor-length cloak was pearly white. Upon its surface, golden etching formed sigils which caused one's eyes to water if one gazed upon them for too long. A sword hung in its scabbard from his hip, but the stranger did not draw it. Instead, he stooped beside his discarded cloak and withdrew a vicious-looking flail. Ebony handled. It trailed nine wicked blades on the ends of the wires with varying degrees of serration and curvature. The storm made a wind chime of the weapon, and it was that as the blades clinked and danced at the end of their strings like macabre puppets, the first of the wolfmen appeared. Eight feet tall, they resembled a traditional lupine of legend as far as basic anatomy was concerned. However, past the overall shape, they differed sharply a product of thousands of years on the other side of the spine, they were a twisted and corrupted mockery of their ancestors. Some sported saliva slick tendrils where the lower jaws should be, and some were more like a huge wolf with a perfectly human head. One resembled a werewolf almost exactly, but was monstrously oversized, standing four feet above his kin. They gnashed their teeth at the sound of the flail across the field from them and began to spread out until the entire clan's hunting party, nine fully-sized males, occupied the far end of the impromptu arena. The huge wolfman barked an incomprehensible phrase in his native language, and all eight of his packmates bounded across the snow. Then they died simultaneously. As they passed the central stump, the wind changed direction. As one, they simply crumbled to the ground, every single bone in their bodies shattered and broken. Bellowing in a raged roar, the vast king of the wolfman advanced, digging his paws into the ground and tearing the stump from its roots before casting it aside. He lumbered past the bodies of his family and then struck out at the stranger before him with a lunging bite. The flail whipped horizontally across his exposed snout. He let out an agonized wail. Eyes and nose permanently damaged, he slashed blindly with his claws, clumsy strikes which his opponent easily dodged. The stranger then struck again, slashing downwards into the creature's leg and leaving the fur and flesh hanging loosely from the bone. 
The beast's roars turned to almost human screams of pain and distress as the man that it dwarfed in size and strength set about flaying it alive, strike by strike. Alvarez's account of the battle ends here, as he reportedly turned away from the spectacle and began to play his lute in an attempt to block out the wails coming from the clearing behind him. The chief stepped back, aghast, from the door. The skull-masked man had returned, but his cloak now loose about his neck, revealing white armor now stained pink with blood. His hooded compatriot hung back, ever-present, and Elverant, liar dangling from its strap, followed behind. In truth, he had not expected any of the three to return, and had hoped that their sacrifice would abet the bloodlust of the wolfman. Your courage has saved us all, he began, stammering and backing into the town hall once more. The masked man silenced him with a wave of his hand. He spoke for the first time since their arrival, and could be heard by all, his voice the distant rumble of a storm. Your people are safe, it is true. Now, the price we agreed. Champion, I... The chief whirled to face the confused villagers huddling around the dying fire pit in the center of the room. His panic gaze settled upon the children playing at the rear of the room, oblivious to the price which must surely be paid. The masked one allowed one bloody gauntlet to rest upon the pommel of his sword. We made a pact, chief. The village leader simply hung his shaggy head, unable to meet the eyes of his champions or his people. Elverich watched them move past the villagers. Nobody objected as the pair gently guided the children from the room. The story did not reach the kingdom in the form of Elverit's writing and half-finished ballad on the subject of the strange heroes for some time. First record of the events which transpired there can actually be found in the journal of a trade caravan captain. He writes, Came upon the village of Coffer today. As expected, they suffered over the winter, but was surprised at how many made it through. Obviously a lot of demand for food and medicine. The strange thing was, when I came into town, the first thing I noticed were the children. They were all linked together by a very long ribbon tied around their waists, presumably to stop them from getting lost. Every single child in Coffer had their eyes removed. The Temple of Eyes had not been seen by mortals since the first armies of the kingdom had been stalled by the monstrous hordes in the foothills of the spine. They moved through the silent corridors noting that the walls, ceiling, and floor were entirely covered with etchings of eyes, blank, cold, and staring. If one did not know better, however, one might swear that some of them blinked. Finally, they came to the central chamber, where an altar, oval and obsidian, awaited them. The hooded once elf produced, from the folds of his robe, small canvas bag, sticky, crimson, and damp, and it turned its contents onto the surface. Twelve pairs of children's eyes gazed up at them. These were quickly joined by the heart of a wolf man, then drizzled with lamp oil. The masked one then leaned in and ignited the offering with his torch. Instantly, Electric blue flames leapt several feet into the air, and a tremendous crash broke the unnerving silence of the place. The great, ebony eye which dominated the wall adjacent to the altar was split by a great spider web of cracks. The pair gazed up at the broken seal in awe of their accomplishment. On the far side of the spine, great, shapeless entities began to shift and twitch in their slumber into the freezing morning of Nosferth. Two strangers departed.
there was much work to be done.